So service. Service is the set of rules we have, special rules for the delivery of, of documents in civil litigation. And you know about the difference between uh, different types of service required for different levels of documents. Um, but the thing about service is that uh, the law deems you not to have received something unless you have been properly served with it, right? And people have a strong incentive to not be involved in civil litigation, particularly when they're defendants, right? You do not want to be part of, of the plaintiff's suit. Therefore, defendants have an incentive to avoid service because if you can avoid service, then you are never deemed to be involved in the suit and you can't be held liable for anything. And this creates the temptation to strategic game play, right? To what we call evasion of service, efforts by parties to intentionally frustrate the rules by making it impossible for the plaintiff to serve them in accordance with, uh, with, with these rules. So um, Martosh and Horton uh, shows how the law tries to deal uh, with, this, uh, with this problem. Okay, so this guy, this guy Horton, right? He's a real, uh, real prince of a guy. Um, he bangs out an email defaming Martosh, you know, um, sort of grotesque lies and misrepresentations about poor Martosh. He writes this on his work computer um, he, uh, he admits that everyone sees it, right? He says, he, he admits that this email got, um, got sent out, um, therefore having this defamatory effect. Uh, and he was, um, uh, he says, the story is that he just typed out this, these lies about his, uh, his work colleague, and then he walked away from his computer and some, uh, bad actor came by and sent it out to everyone. Uh, so that's his story. Uh, Horton is not, uh, sorry, Martosh is not taking this lying down, right? He brings a lawsuit for defamation. And he, in fact, um, obtains default judgment. So, so could someone remind us what default judgment is? That's right, that's right. So, uh, so he gets default judgment, and then he goes ahead with garnishment proceedings. How about garnishment? There's another, like, I mean, there's a thousand weird words per hour in civil procedure. What's garnishment? Yes? Um, like when, you're, when someone doesn't pay what they owe you, go to a different way of trying to obtain it, so you can, like, garnish it or take it from something like um, their paycheck or their bank account. Absolutely, that's right, that's right. It's a way to get the money that's owed to you by basically going to a third party who owes money to the person who owes money to you, and then the law lets you get the money from that third party. Garnishment. Okay, so the plaintiff um, issued this lawsuit. Uh, the defendant did nothing. The plaintiff got default judgment for $41,000 and proceeds to garnish it. So on what basis does Horton now want that default judgment set aside? and want the garnishment canceled. Um, yes, please. So he basically tries to argue that he did not receive the documents as he had indicated that his place of employment or his place of employment indicated that they don't deal with personal matters. But there's the argument raised by, well not the argument, there's the reasoning raised by the court that then why would they open it if they don't, um, why would they open a stamp He didn't, he didn't really get it. Yes, that's right. That's right. So, uh, so he says, I didn't get it. Horton says, you know, the rules say that Martosh was supposed to serve me personally, right? This is originating process. I'm entitled to, to, to wait for this document to be handed to me personally. Um, he says, um, but Martosh um, knew where I, where I worked, right? So he went to, or, went to court and he got an order allowing him to use an alternative to personal service. 
right? Because we know already that courts can waive this normally stringent requirement for personal service um, if, if you bring a motion seeking that. So Martosh went to court and got this, uh, got this alternative personal service. Um, and Horton says, no fair. He should have complied with the rules of civil procedure and done his personal service. Uh, what does the judge say to that? Uh, well, first of all, the judge says uh, the defendant um, you know, communicated with the process server by email prior to the order being made, refused to provide his home address, declined his invitation to arrange service at a time and place of his choice, and invited the plaintiff to correspond with them at the place of employment. So the judge says that the defendant obviously knew what was up. He knew he was the subject of a lawsuit, and he was actually communicating with the process server and kind of leading the process server on sort of a wild goose chase by saying, uh, oh, come and try to contact me here to give me the documents. And then, of course, once the process server got there, there was a whole other story about why the process server couldn't, in fact, serve him there. Uh, so this is why one of the reasons why um, why personal services is expensive, right? Why, uh, where'd she go? Our um, friend uh, Tracy up here, right? Uh, Jen, Jen, right? This is why Jen costs 150 bucks because sometimes she has to deal with this kind of garbage, right? Where someone's running away from her and she's got to got to track them down. Okay, so first of all, the court says, uh, says you know, you're playing games. Second of all, the court says, Master Birnbaum's order cannot be collaterally attacked. So Master Birnbaum was the judge who, uh, who gave the plaintiff the right to use this alternative personal service. And, and now the court's saying that Horton's trying to collaterally attack that. What does that mean, collaterally attack? Well, that means that Horton is trying to turn this into an appeal of the master's order, right? Master Birnbaum's order was not appealed. If Horton thought it was wrong to allow Martosh to use this alternative personal service, then Horton's remedy was to appeal that order. Horton failed to do so, and now they're, they're using this, Horton's using this default judgment uh, proceeding to attack that. So collateral attack is where you are, you know, challenging something which could be challenged, but you're doing it in the wrong form at, and at the wrong time. Okay, so so far, um, Horton is not doing well. But he's got another argument, which is based on Rule 19.02, which basically says that default orders can be set aside without being appealed, right? So what that means in practice is that if you get, if you're a plaintiff and you get a default judgment because the defendant has simply done nothing, simply ignored your statement of claim, and you know there's there's nothing wrong with the reasons for which you were granted default judgment, the defendant is still allowed to come out of the woodwork later and say uh, and have that default judgment set aside. So this is another example of of the liberality of the rules of civil procedure, right? And, and this sort of sense that the, the rules are kind of, kind of bendable. Because, you know, every statement of claim says in huge block letters on the form, Mr. or Mrs. Defendant, if you do not defend against this, default judgment can be taken against you and we're gonna come and take your money and, and you'll have no further chance to, to, to deal with this. And then you actually, the plaintiff, the defendant does nothing, the plaintiff gets that default judgment the, def the defendant can still come back and say, well, I want that default judgment set aside. Liberal rules, bendable rules. Okay, so you can do that um, under rule uh, 19.08, set aside a default judgment. And uh, you can do so um, on the basis of this three-part test. The defendant can set aside default if the default was unintentional and he has a valid explanation for the default the motion was launched forthwith after the judgment came to his attention, and he has a good defense on the merits. So, uh, so Horton does, uh, does um, well enough on uh, the second branch of the test, he brought this quickly, but uh, he bombs number one and number three. So the, the judge says the defendant um, could easily have avoided this problem had he been the slightest bit cooperative with the plaintiff's process server, so here we're going to number one here, branch number one. Um, 
He, uh, he says he never got it. The judge uh, pretty obviously thinks he's lying. Um, I am of the view that he did receive it, reviewed it, and affected its return in an effort to avoid dealing with the claim. Um, and even if Horton did not actually receive the claim in his place of employment, that is not good enough, right? He has to show why he did nothing to make it easier for the wheels of justice to turn, right? Why he, he took every step in his power to prevent the, the thing from being served personally upon him. Paragraph 11, I'm convinced similarly that Mr. Horton has brought this motion not because he learned of the claim for the first time as a result of the default judgment, but rather because he discovered the judgment had been made against him despite his evasion. Okay, so uh, Horton bombs branch number one. Um, branch number three, uh, he also does not do well, right? Um, it's plain, the judge says, he published this defamatory email, so it's a good defense on the merits. Here, the court's going to look at you know, if the defendant hypothetically actually had uh, responded with a statement of defense and then the matter had been adjudicated on its merits, how strong does this defense appear to be? And the answer here is not strong at all because it's clear that he wrote the email uh, and that the plaintiff actually suffered, suffered the damages. So the upshot is the motion uh, to set aside default judgment is dismissed. And, uh, and, and Martosh can go ahead and enforce the default judgment, garnish the wages, and so on. But it's also, so, so the plaintiff wins, but it's kind of like, um, you gotta think, like he walked away from this not necessarily overwhelmed <laughs> with satisfaction and faith in the civil justice system, right? If you think about what this guy had to do, right? He, uh, he discovers he's been defamed by this email, uh, he, um, and so what does he have to do to actually enforce his rights? Well, he has to, first of all, hire a lawyer, write the statement of claim, right? Then you've got to pay the lawyer and pay Jen, the process server, to, to actually try to affect personal service, right? That costs three times as much as it would because Horton's playing all these games. You can't track him down. Then the plaintiff had to go to court and get this motion for substituted service, had to pay his lawyer to argue that, look, we can't affect personal service, can we please uh, do it some other way, right? That was undefended, but it still costs money to argue that. So he gets that motion for substitute service, he serves the document according to the motion for substitute service, then he has to get the motion for default judgment, he has to go back to court to find the defendant in default, then he has to go back to court, pay again to start enforcing, to start the garnishment proceedings, and now Horton appears out of nowhere and, uh, and comes to court and, and requires the plaintiff to defend the defendant's motion to set aside default judgment. So, you know, Martosh in our system would get costs, right? So, so, so when we get to cost, we'll see that a plaintiff like this who has had to do eight steps for something that should have only required one step will be entitled to an extra cost order from his adversary to compensate him for what he had to go through. But the cost order will not pay everything, right? Cost orders down only pay about 60%, right? If you're completely successful, totally vindicated, uh, and, and the judge sides with you 100%, generally you still won't get more than 60% from, uh, from the other side of what you had to pay your own lawyer to get there. Plus, of course, no one's ever going to compensate Martosh for, uh, for you know, all the time and aggravation he had to go through to get to, get to this result. So this is civil litigation, right? I mean, we, we, we constantly have this um, you know, desire to, to make absolutely sure everyone's heard, give the defendant every last opportunity to, to, to present their case, uh, but it all adds up pretty quickly in terms of, in terms of costs. Uh, okay, so the last thing I'll say about this is that uh, this is described at the bottom of your reading as an endorsement. I'll just tell you what an endorsement is as opposed to a judgment. Uh, an endorsement is a judgment, but it's a short judgment. Um, often, if, if it's just sort of a few paragraphs on a procedural issue, it will be called an endorsement. And um, very often, unfortunately, they're actually handwritten by judges on the backs of litigation documents, uh, which is lots of fun to, uh, to try to decipher. Okay, so um, sorry about the short class, but um, I will pick it up with motions on Tuesday, and I'll let you know what we'll figure out about the, about the quiz.